Well, hello and welcome. My name is Rob Lively. I am sitting up in beautiful Maine, and I'm going to serve as the moderator for today's session, session number two of the panels, where we will be looking at environmental issues as well as addressing current challenges in other areas. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things is that if, uh, if you want to go to the chat and list your name where you had your Fulbright and maybe where you're situated now, that's it's always helpful to know. Uh, during the conversation today with our presenters, as questions arise in your own mind, please go to the Q&A, the question and answers. Uh, if you could list the speaker's name, their first name, and then the brief question. And then at the end, what we will do is we will go back to these questions and uh, address them. And by knowing their name, that will be very helpful. Also, I'll just give a very brief introduction to each of the, of the presenters. But if you go to the Fulbright Association website, you'll be able to see uh, more detailed information about their biographical background. What I'll do is that I will go ahead and introduce all of the speakers in the order in which they're going to present. And then as each of them finishes uh, presenters, I will serve as the transition to the next speaker. So first of all, we have Empowering Tomorrow Scientists, Culturally Relevant Education for Global Classrooms. That is the speaker is Annalise Klein. Annalise is a science educator she received a Fulbright DAST Award in 2019, where she worked with teachers at a secondary school in Uganda to develop best practices in STEM inquiry and interdisciplinary projects. Next will be environmental education projects for English language learners uh, by Dr. Kristen Lems. Kristen has had two Fulbrights, awards to Algeria and to Mongolia, working with practicing teachers of English as a foreign language. She has also worked in Chile as a State Department senior ESL specialist. Thirdly, we have building upon a Fulbright Fellowship in Kenya with Gloria Simono and with co-presenter Lillian Obanyo. Gloria has had over 35 years experience in the field of expressive arts therapy, where she has taken her, which has taken her around the world, and she has served her Fulbright in Nairobi. Lillian has an 18 year background in community nursing. She's a senior counselor and a child therapist. She began her as a clinical nurse where she worked in the Ministry of Health in the government of Kenya. And then finally, we have a, a discussion of the book, A Time to Talk, Raising Anti-Racist Kids with Michael Young and Sandy George. Michael is the illustrator of the book, A Time to Talk. He's a high school visual arts teacher and a Fulbright ETA in Madrid from 2011 to 2012. He is based in New York City. Sandy George is also based in New York. She is the author of A Time to Talk, and she is a, uh, special, a elementary school special education uh, teachers. So thank you very much panelists for, for participating. So let's begin with Annalise. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. All right, can we see the screen? Are we good? Okay. Um, so thank you so much for being here. My name is Annalise. Um, in this very short 10 minutes, we're going to be talking about how um, global and cultural relevance in science education works um, with an example with climate change, and then how justice-centered science education challenges the status quo. And we're going to be looking at the project from um, Uganda that I did last fall with my colleagues in Sudere very quick um, about me. So I do have my master's in education um, from Johns Hopkins University. My undergraduate degrees are in chemistry and in English. Um, most recently, I was an AP chemistry teacher in San Jose, California. I've taught science for six years. Um, I had the Fulbright Distinguished Award in Teaching uh, in Uganda last fall. 
And currently I work as an education consultant with a tribal school district up in Alaska and a re-engagement site in Washington state. Uh, the school that I was at last fall, exactly a year ago, um, was Sereri Township Secondary School on the eastern side of the country, about seven hours drive east from Kampala. Um, it's very rural. Uh, I worked at a private boarding school, worked with uh, mostly the chemistry and agriculture teachers there, and there's about 1,300 students who board. All right, so let's talk about globalizing science education. So I believe good science scholarship is interdisciplinary. If we want to be able, it's, it's not just about memorizing uh, laws and formulas and doing math problems. Uh, it's about being able to communicate and contextualize things uh, across different experiences. Okay, that's the globalizing piece. How do we problem solve in different ways, depending on our culture or our lived experience? And uh, I really want to take us to this power of the narrative. Um, who is telling the story specifically uh, in science classrooms and for my context in secondary. So I'm going to use the example of climate change. Um, and as a science teacher in San Jose, California, you know, how do I frame this issue to my students? It's not as simple as you would think. Okay, So I've just got two very broad questions. Uh, when I'm talking to my students, who am I telling them are the experts? Um, who is affected? Are they affected all in the same ways? Um, and so just think in your head, who are some experts? Maybe who, who would teachers use as experts in climate change? Uh, you might be thinking of some of the faces that are here, all fantastic people who've done fantastic work. Uh, they're all white. They all have come from a kind of similar lived experience if we're thinking about the larger context of the world. And if I'm thinking as a science teacher, then my job is to create global citizens. Okay. So as I was researching and getting ready to go to Uganda last year, came across Vanessa Nakate, and there is her Twitter handle if you want to quick write that down. Um, she is a fantastic young woman who is an environmental advocate. Um, she stages a lot of protests with youth um, in Kampala. She raises a lot of um, pertinent issues of how climate change is affecting people on the continent of Africa. Now, uh, she was in the news uh, in January of this year because the Associated Press would, had a conference. There are all these youth who were you know, doing all these great things. Yeah, they cropped her out. Um, she was right there in that picture and pointed this out and called the Associated Press out um, and had some really wise words to say about this very traumatic and unfortunate experience. Uh, she says, environmental activism has been framed as Europe influencing the world not the other way around. We have become used to our experience being excluded. Okay, so I just want us to, to think about that for a minute. And then the second question that I had asked at the beginning, who is affected? Okay, um, I, I see a lot of curriculum as a, as a teacher, just talking broadly about climate change and how it's gonna be bad for us or bad for the world. Um, but we don't really talk too much about the fact that countries who are least responsible for climate change are the ones who are right now experiencing the most life altering effects. Um, here on the right, we've got top 10 countries with the lowest CO2 emissions per capita. Um, they are in on the continent of Africa. Uh, and a lot of these countries are experiencing the daily effects of climate change now. Severe weather, weather patterns, unpredictability, leading to food insecurity, leading to nutrient deficiency, just as a couple things that are uh, a lived experience experience day to day. And just to kind of wrap this up, the, I just want to bring in this quote from Jason Moore, who's an environmental historian. He wrote this very provocative article about who is responsible for the climate crisis. And he goes back into history and uh, he says, okay, in the 16th century, he notices there's this rupture in Europe, how scientists, capitalists, imperial strategists understand um, the reality. There's this dualism between civilization, putting those air quotes in, and savagery. And we see this dispossession of some humans uh, of their humanity from the perspective of European scientists uh, and people controlling that narrative. Okay, and that has continued to have an effect on so many populations in the world, particularly indigenous people. Um, Jason also includes the Irish um, to, to women, to African slaves, to colonial peoples all around the world. So 
science is not without bias, okay? For us in Western academia, whether we are at the elementary or high school or college level, we, we have assumed the privilege of skipping over sometimes how we assign responsibility, uh, recognizing inequitable global outcomes, and particularly for climate change, uh, silencing non-Western methods of environmental management um, and other scientific ways of knowing and doing. We've created this canon uh, that we have just assumed is, is unbiased and just the way things are. So what do we do with that <laughs> now that we acknowledge that and understand that? So when I went to Uganda and in my practice as a chemistry teacher, I love this idea of justice-centered science education, okay, where we, we are contextualizing science learning in relevant phenomena, inviting students to be change makers and critics, not just receivers of information. Um, this was this term was coined by Daniel Morales Doyle, who's a professor of education. And he says, we believe in the power of young people to work with those of us who aren't so young anymore in intergenerational ways. Uh, and I want to also say intercultural ways um, so that the work of justice centered science pedagogy is really about how does learning science factor into that to imagine better futures. So when I was in Uganda, um, I quickly saw, okay, we've got um, national exams driving instruction. Uh, we also have huge classrooms, okay? We've got like 90 kids in one class. And, and it requires teachers to have a really strong grasp of content knowledge, familiarity with the national exam and the way that they frame knowledge. And students develop really strong recall skills and work ethic, but there was no project-based learning. There was no STEM, that interdisciplinary piece happening. So how do we move to that? And the way I explained it when I was working with my colleagues in Uganda is, okay, if we imagine that knowledge is water, right now teaching to the national exam is like, we're imagining our students are empty buckets. Okay, we fill them up with knowledge and then we tip them over, usually in the form of a standardized exam. Great for knowledge retention, great for static learning. Um, and the student's only role is to receive and to regurgitate. Now, instead, what if we imagine our students are like water wheels? Now, what happens when we add water to a water wheel? We get movement, we get momentum, there's energy. So in this way, we're thinking about students being tasked with solving problems and applying knowledge today. So that's what we decided to do. We said, okay, our, our chemistry students that we're gonna you know, work with at the school in Serere, we're gonna have them create solutions around one specific community problem that's related to climate change. And then when I go back to San Jose, my students are going to learn about the environmental issues from a US and Ugandan perspective, and they're gonna peer review that Ugandan project. Okay? And the goal was to just highlight different ways of problem solving and doing project iterations. Now, we decided, we went to the kids in Serere and we said, all right, flooding, this is something that happens a lot. Uh, causes soil erosion. So how could we get cover crops to grow uh, healthier in a cost-effective way? I'm really summarizing. <laughs> we got the kids on board in how we chose this question, but I've got like a minute. So I'm cranking through what we did. Um, and we created this project called Greening Serere Township. Students decided to create zero cost fertilizers. They live in subsistence farming communities. They don't have money to spend on um, industrialized fertilizers. So they weren't planting anything in the ground. Um, each plot contained, the students planted a plot, each plot contained half maize, half cowpea seeds. And they used a couple different fertilizers that you can see listed here um, to see what would happen. Would it help the plants grow? They measured plant height every other day. So there they are, they harvested some bones from the local butcher shop, they roasted them, made bone meal, sifted it, and there they are planting. You can see some of the students who were really intrigued what was going on behind them, um, and they cataloged what was going on. Now, over the course of several weeks, they found some things that worked and some things that didn't, and they had their parents come in for a presentation day, about 200 parents who are all farmers, um, learning about how they could put some of the waste products around their house into the uh, soil to help their plants grow. So we then brought it back to the US classroom, had them create some feedback, ask questions, dive deeper. Um, this part did get cut short because of COVID, um, but the idea was to create some sort of international science review board between these two classrooms. Okay, so in conclusion, um, I just wanna leave with a couple thoughts. 
is science really all that unbiased and clinical? Oh, no, that's a rhetorical question. Okay. So what does representation look like in our STEM classrooms? It's not just posters of people of color who are also scientists. Okay. It goes a lot deeper. And then finally, imagine what could happen in a world where diverse problem solvers are welcomed and celebrated. So thank you so much. Um, if you have questions or thoughts about this, please send it into the Q&A now and we'll be addressing it at the end. Um, I'm going to yeah pass it back to Rob. Thank you very much, Annalise. That's wonderful and such an important topic now, not only nationally, but internationally. And really what you're showing is it culturally responsible science, yeah, science education. So, so thank you so much. Uh, and as you mentioned, if you have questions for her, add them to the Q&A and we'll address them at the end. Next, we would like to have Kristen uh, talking about environmental education. And is Kristen here with us? Yes, I am. Just oh, a moment. Good, Let me uh, un unmute and make myself visible. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Very good. Hang on. Let me find my presentation. Uh, wait a moment. I had this all ready and then, OK, here we go. <laughs> all right, you can start timing me. I know this is, this is 10 minutes. Um, I am a professor of ESL bilingual education at National Lewis University, and I teach teachers who are becoming teachers of ESL, English, English language learners, ESL and bilingual education. So um, when I taught the ESL methods course uh, last fall, we focused on sustainability plans for their PSYOP lesson plans, and that's a kind of lesson plan that is very research-based uh, for English language learners. The students, uh, put their plans together and practice them in our class. I come from the position that climate science belongs in the classroom and we cannot put it off. It's morally wrong to deny kids the truth. Fact-based education empowers children and they need to be ready for the clean energy economy. That's a, that's a positive spin on it, isn't it? <laughs> and this is the more negative spin. I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic and act as if the house was on fire. So it was in that spirit that I scheduled these, um, these lesson plans to be done in environmental themes. So I use the word sustainability and I suggest that you think about the same because sustainability answers a larger question, how should we live? And it is a more positive spin on the environment, ecology, climate change, habitat, or species destruction. So I asked them to do sustainability focused projects. Just so you know, there were 36 in-service teachers and one group was in the Chicago Public Schools and the other was in a large suburban district. The teachers uh, spanned pre-K through grade 12 and taught all different subjects. But I knew that when we all had in common a sustainability-based project that we would learn from each other. And boy, we did. <laughs> in order to do this, I taught them in the spring and prepared them basically four months in advance that we were going to be doing a sustainability-based lesson plan in the fall. And I also um, adapted the rubric to grade them, which gave them an opt-out if they absolutely could not find a sustainability theme. Then I also let them look at the SIAP template so that they could become very familiar with them. And wow, the results were spectacular. <laughs> it was very exciting. I'll show you six of them, one minute each. For preschool, there were two that stood out. One, the Peter's Chair Project, and the second, the Red Wriggler Worm Composting. These are both preschool teachers. Repurposing with Peter's Chair is a project done by Kim Edwards, who works in a preschool. She always teaches the book Peter's Chair to her four-year-olds because she wants to prepare them for accepting and loving new siblings who come along. And if any of you have read this book, you know that Peter, as you can see from this picture here, <laughs> is looking at his old chair very resentfully because he doesn't want it to get passed on to his baby sister. But the fact is he's outgrown it anyway. So the whole idea is how can you make the chair a gift from you to your baby sibling? So um, instead of talking about 
repurposing a chair for a sibling, Kim turned it into repurposing a chair by reusing the chair. And these are the vocabulary words that she taught before she read the book. Before the book was read, there she is with her four-year-olds um, in large group instruction. First, she read the book. Then she did an anchor chart with them. And of course, they uh, supplied words for reduce, reuse, and recycle. And it was added to as the students learned about the three R's. Then she had them draw a chair that they would repurpose. So that is all of their wonderful children's art. And then she moved to a much more interesting step. Chicago Public Schools has a huge warehouse of leftover uh, furniture and they offer them to Chicago Public School teachers. And Kim noticed that all of these darling little well-made wooden chairs had been put in this warehouse and rejected. Because I guess uh, some classrooms preferred plastic chairs. So Kim uh, took these chairs, had them brought to her school, and each student was given a wooden chair to decorate with their family. The children and parents wrote stories about the chairs. They named the chairs. They had a pre-K chair museum, and students and parents were invited to visit the museum. And the, the designs were up for two months. And here are some of the chairs <laughs> that the children painted with their families. It was just a spectacular project. And um, she used the idea of repurposing, recycling, reusing. You don't have to throw out things that are perfectly usable. You can redecorate them. And most brilliantly, it, it also tied in with their, their anchor book, Peter's Chair. Look at these chairs, <laughs> all painted by families. Very fanciful. The next lesson was Composting with Preschoolers by Mandy Call. Mandy works at Courtney Language Arts in Uptown, which is a CPS school, and that you can see her in our, in our methods class. So right here, she's with the other teachers. She decided to start composting to teach about the Earth's environment by starting a classroom compost. Students will learn about bugs and worms, and these are the vocabulary words she taught before setting it up. Compost, decompose, landfill, etc. And it started with a question of the day, what is this? <laughs> and of course that is a red wriggler worm. So she practiced this with us because in our methods class, we kind of you know, prepped the teachers for doing these projects. So here's one of our, our classmates answering the questions. I see this, it is this, I wonder why, I wonder how. So the children answer these questions. And there they are, the beautiful red wriggler worms. Yes, these are the worms you get from bait shops. And here we are in our methods class looking at the worms and we were asked to draw them as well, which is just exactly what the preschoolers do. And then she started a KWL, what we know, what we want to know and what we learned. And this is the storybook about our worms that they put together. Here are pictures of children looking at the compost and there was a compost helper. And there's a manual food processor. You can see that he's pulling the string. There's a safe way to shred and chop up food that doesn't get the kids anywhere near a, a, a knife. And every week they observed the worms and they called it Wormy Wednesday. So they devoted quite a bit of time to that. And the cafeteria staff got interested and started contributing things like banana peels and other leftovers that could be used in the compost. And she also, gave time for looking at unexpected things. Look at the kids looking with their magnifying glasses. They discovered uh, nematodes, little white things, the white bugs in our compost. So that was also fun. She didn't expect to find that. And she had a lot of resources. Every one of these teachers had to find a lot of resources and the resources are there. Elementary, there were two projects, reducing carbon footprints and the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. The first one was Sarah Zalonis, who did re Reducing Carbon Footprint. These are her language objectives. The important thing is that kids learn about their carbon footprint. They write an action plan and they explain their action plan. This is a fantastic uh, project for English language learners because they're using all four domains, listening, speaking, reading, and writing. So the kids uh, had all these materials. Uh, she brought in some classroom books that they read aloud, how to reduce your carbon footprint. Here are the kids making their action plans in small groups. And then they, they actually, their carbon footprint, they drew around their foot 
and they uh, color the percentage that their carbon footprint was making from home, food, transportation, and water. Then they made plans about how they would reduce their carbon footprints, and this is their writing. And uh, they wrote their action plans. It's just, I wish I had time for you to read all of these adorable plans. <laughs> um, use, uh, that's supposed to be number five, quick showers, take quick showers. <laughs> And then they drew pictures of themselves carrying out their, their action plans. And then she had them at, answer why reducing their carbon footprint was important. And this is so touching because these are what all these third graders had to say. I can save the earth. I love the last one. This, this was an immigrant child from Ukraine. The earth does not have much say about itself. Next project is the Pacific Garbage Patch, seventh grade science by Elizabeth Morales. And these are the content objectives and the standards of the next generation science standards. The language of science, I will use grade level vocabulary when writing and speaking to ask questions and defend my evidence. Now she was very lucky in this case because National Geographic has a fantastic um, item on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So she found all her materials for this on the National Geographic site. And these are some of the words they learned and studied. We have one minute. Oh my gosh, okay. And so uh, these are some of the pictures from National Geographic. And then they ca calculated their carbon footprint. Last one for high school fashion and sustainability. One of the teachers who's an art teacher talked about fast fashion and they all made a t-shirt quilt from recycled t-shirts because you don't have to throw out your cloth. <laughs> she studied other uh, fabric artists. The last one was ocean acidification and the students blew into vials of four kinds of liquid to record the pH so that they could figure out how it would cause ocean acidification and did final writing. Last, here's a picture of all of us we presented at the Illinois TESOL conference, and I hope that we'll be able to present again somewhere. Thank you very much. Well, well thank you. That, that, that was very exciting. It, it's to see the creativity and how much fun the kids were having. As a family, we really loved uh, Peter's chair because when our, when our daughter was born, our dear uh, father-in-law, but made her a nice small chair. Oh. But, but then when her brother was born four years later, she wasn't so sure about sharing the chair. So my <laughs> dear grandfather made another chair. And so oh. now we have, we have two small children's chairs that have now been passed on to the grandkids. So <laughs> the chairs are important. I'm sure they're very small chairs. <laughs> indeed, indeed they are. So, well, thank you so much. Thank you. Next, uh, Gloria and Lillian, we look forward to your presentations. Okay, um, hello everybody. My name is Gloria Simino. I want to welcome you to our session. I'm really happy that you are here with us today. Um, in 2007, I was awarded a Fulbright to lecture and do research in Kenya with the Kenya Association of Professional Counselors. Harambe Arts, which I founded during that period, is a community-run expressive arts therapy organization serving children and women living in poverty and with extreme trauma. When I first got to Kenya, I had a lot of ideas and a lot of assumptions about what I wanted to do how I wanted to teach, what I wanted to accomplish. And I was also really seriously proud to be a Fulbrighter. Um, and I quickly realized that I had as much to learn as I had to offer. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I believe that Harambe Arts has been so successful, is that from the beginning, we listen to the community wisdom and we respond to real needs in the community. Um, 13 years later, we are still going strong with a staff of 14, four of whom were children in the program. For example, Brandon and I met in the Kabir slum when he was six years old and he was attending Harambe Arts art groups. I immediately noticed his leadership abilities 
and I've been sponsoring his school fees ever since. He's now 20 years old. He's one of our highly skilled staff and he's completing a diploma course in psychology with the same institute that hosted my Fulbright. Um, in 2011, Harambe Arts also started a program in Nepal, working with survivors of sex trafficking. And over a period of six years, I trained seven survivors in our methodology, and they now lead workshops to support recently rescued girls, HIV positive women, and others experiencing relationship violence. <clears throat> Rina, who is pictured here in the middle, was 10 years old when she was sold by her father and she spent four years in a brothel in India. When she was rescued and repatriated, Rena was shunned by her community. She's now manager of an anti-trafficking organization in Kathmandu and she's Harambe Arts Assistant Country Director in Nepal. Rena thought that she would never do anything with her life and through our efforts and mentorship, she is thriving and she's an inspiring role model for others who have experienced similar trauma. Thanks to another Fulbright, I began implementing programs in Haiti and Dominica in 2018. We are an arts organization, but not in the traditional sense. We do not teach art. However, we use art as a tool for individuals to be able to express that they're unable to put in words and to begin a healing process. Children all over the world, when asked, how are you doing? They generally say, I'm fine. But when you see their artwork, you know that they are not fine. And you'll see, be seeing examples of the children we work with as we proceed. In our case, the impact of a Fulbright is not just about scholarship. It's about heart and it's about connection and learning to trust again, and about giving the power, giving power of, sorry, and about the power of giving a voice to the voiceless. Lillian Obonio is a nurse and a child counselor, and she was a student in my first month long certificate course in Nairobi. She stood out immediately for her phenomenal skills, experience, and deep heart. And we couldn't run her on the arts without her. She is joining us today. Lillian has been her on the arts country director since the project's initiation. And as we go on, she will share about each project. Um, <clears throat> Harambe means let's all pull together in the Swahili language. Around the world using the arts, Harambe arts is transformed and improving the lives of women and children who suffered the devastating effects of trauma. Our methodology is based on respect and love for all children. And particularly, we follow the three theoretical frameworks that you'll see about here. Child-centered theory um, encourages children to explore their own interests and make their own decisions. And our job is to have complete faith in the child's timing and choices for their own growth. Attachment theory is, um, states that each child has an innate need to bond with at least one strong attachment figure, usually the mother. And if the attachment is broken during the first two years of life, the children will suffer long-term consequences. Through her on the arts, we have developed arts-based techniques that speak to broken attachment and have been proven successful in repairing. Somatic-based therapy approach is focused on the nervous system's response to traumatic stress and steps to restore the individual to a resilient zone. There are several steps we use to regain equilibrium, grounding, resourcing, and tracking. And all of these methodologies are very accessible and um, used by all of our trainers and staff. Here is our current Harambe Arts staff in Kenya. And within this picture, you can see Brandon in the first row, the one I mentioned, who's now 20 years old, and the other three who were children in the program. We also have uh, Jennifer, 
who was a prisoner attending our workshop at La Gata Women's Prison, and she's also been hired. Lillian is standing next to Jennifer in the back row. In Kenya, we have three projects, one at the Mathare School for Special Needs Children, one in the Kibera Slum, which has been ongoing since the very first day in 2008, and Langata Women's Prison. And now I will turn this over to Lillian to talk uh, about the Mathare School. Hello, I'm Lillian Obonyo, Arambe Arts Kenya Country Director. I will tell you about our program in Madare, but I also want to emphasize that Arambe Arts Kenya is a Kenyan owned and run organization. Gloria supervises and trains the staff, travels to Kenya once a year to be on site and fundraises, but the important thing is the important decisions and directions that are taken from and made by the team. I'll talk about Madara Special School. Madara Special School is a special needs student. In Kenya, there's enormous stigma for differently able children. At Arambe Arts, we see them as loving, special, and beyond their disability that they have. We see how unique and beautiful they are. When we started the program, we were seeing 12 to 14 children weekly. Now we work with the average of 70 children per week with a long waiting list of children who really want and yearn to join us. We are often told that the children are not able to do anything. That's what the teachers tell us. But um, if we take the children and have them in session, with the Rambe Arts, we start believing in them. Apart from believing in them that they have great potential within them, because that for sure we know. And we are there as witnesses, just being present and the children are able to connect with us in different ways. They confide in us because we have created a trusting relationship. They tell us things they've never told their parents. They tell us things they've never told their teachers. And so we have created a joyful community with the children, with the parents, and with the teachers. The parents come to witness what exactly we are doing with their children because they don't believe the artwork that the children have created and gone with at home. So we usually invite them to come and visit the group while we're having our sessions, just to observe what we do with the children. Most of the teachers think that we are miracle workers. And so that is what they call us. But we usually ask ourselves, why? But because when they bring for us the children, they tell us that these children don't have speech. But soon, the children want to share their artwork and they talk to us. So basically, the children get to believe in us. Thank you, Lily. Um, now we're going to talk about Langata Women's Prison. Um, in 2008, one of the wardens came out as HIV positive and she suggested to start a support group for positive inmates. It was approved, I was asked to lead the group and slowly the group has grown in numbers from eight in 2008 to more than 70 each group that we run now. Um, and it's wildly popular within the prison. Um, all of the prisoners uh, numbering about 750 have gone for voluntary testing to find out if they're HIV positive simply because they wanna join our support group. And the ones who come back tested as negative are often disappointed because they won't be able to be a part of our fantastic group. Um, Lily, can you please talk about your experience at Langata? We lead sessions both in the main prison for the women who are condemned, most of whom have committed murder. And the ones who are in the remand session waiting to be sentenced. What stands out for me is the kind of trauma that these women go through. How vulnerable they are, because if you are in the condemned session, you have tons of anxiety. You're not able to have visitors. 
which means you have no freedom. The condemned women are not only allowed to do chores, anything that would give them a sense of normalcy. They are in the prison within a prison. They are never visited. The fact that we get an opportunity to visit the women regularly is a lifeline for them. The art program gives those women hope. During the group session, we give them an opportunity to share their stories and they feel they are being listened to without judgment. They smile, they laugh, and even feel joy. In the prison, they never have an opportunity to share. When they share, they feel validated and respected. And basically that is what Arambe Art stands for. The women express themselves fully through painting, writing, dancing, singing, and they feel normal for a brief period of time. We see them as beautiful individuals, not as criminals. The prisoners see the Harambe art staff as sisters, brothers, and they see us as the family that they so longed for. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. This is um, a group of prisoners, and you can see they're wearing some strange glasses. That's part of my collection. I carry them all over the world with me, those glasses, um, to ignite fun and play because within our sessions, we go really deep into painful material. And then we come back up and we celebrate and we have a great time and have joy. Um, Kabir Islam, these are art programs for children who live in conditions that are really difficult for us to imagine. No, um, no running water, little bit of electricity, very little. Um, uh, sewers running outside of the homes. And Lily, can you please talk a little bit about the Kibera program? Most of the children that participate in our Kibera group live in terrible poverty, often going without food. Many of the children have enormous pressure in the home to care for their young siblings and to do chores. The Saturday group has become a real refuge for them where they can express any and all feelings that they have. They can be children in our sessions, enjoy themselves and also feel valued. They are listened to. We used to have 20 children in the group and now it's over 200 children per session. Our staff is amazing, working together as a team and treating the kids with lots of respect. Our staff consist of, consist of 14 people including four young adults who attend, attended as children at 13, th that's 13 years ago. Now they help facilitate the groups and they really understand the children's needs and pain. There is so much joy and the teamwork within the groups in the painting, the dancing and games. And the children are also fed after the session. We also teach leadership skills. And if there's a problem, we model how to talk to each other while the other person listens and forgiveness. Thank you. Um, Lily, would you like to talk a little bit about what we're doing since the pandemic started? In Kenya, since the pandemic started, that is in March, we have not been able to do our physical session with the women, neither with the children. However, we have done projects that are valuable to the community, for example, making the face masks, which the government guidelines gave out. And uh, some people were being caught in Kibera because of not wearing masks. So we made masks over thousands and distributed to families and people in Kibera slums. We also set up sanitation spots for hand washing with soap, which is still ongoing up to now. We also hold our Zoom meeting because we no longer have sessions twice a month to support us in terms of trauma because it's been very traumatizing time for us. And uh, out of these sessions, Gloria also attends. And this has made us more healthier, more positive than when the COVID started and we had all this anxiety. We see hope, and this is a testimony that we are all strengthened as staff. In addition, we are continuing to pay our staffs their stipends, despite the fact that we're no longer doing uh, physical sessions and also provide bulk of foods on a monthly basis. Thank you, Lily. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about our program in Nepal. Um, seven women who have survived trafficking have been trained in depth in our, in our methodology. Uh, this is them most currently. And they're now really strong, self-confident, making an enormous, enormous difference within their community. Um, they are healthy advocates for other girls. And they had to face their own painful history. And now without shame, they've become powerful role models and also fighting for human rights. Um, This is a picture of girls recently rescued from a brothel in India. And also you can see them wearing the strange sunglasses in my collection. You can also see how young these girls are. It's actually an epidemic in Nepal. The sex trafficking industry is not getting, getting any better. In fact, during COVID it's, it's exacerbated and it's gotten much worse. And it's all due to the enormous poverty uh, we work in remote villages, not only in Kathmandu, we work in safe houses and we lead trainings for other organizations. Um, one, one of the projects that we're most proud about, we call our Sisterhood Project. And through Sisterhood, we offer opportunities for Kenyan women prisoners and Nepali survivors of trafficking to support each other. They've been told, you have sisters in Kenyan, in Kenyan prison, you have sisters in Nepal. They also have HIV, they have fear, they're stigmatized. And so the two groups create messages which I carry back and forth. Um, one of the women prisoners said, I've been in prison for seven years. And today when I read your message, I felt my heart for the first time. This is Susan, one of the prisoners making a message for the women in Nepal. Um, and on the left is Mabel, one of the prisoners holding um, bracelets that were sent from the women in Nepal for the Kenyan prisoners. Uh, you are not alone is a painting that one of them made. And I can't underestimate the power and the importance of this project. Um, the Kenyan women said to me, I used to think we were doing very small things. And when I see the pictures of the Kenyan women and how much they appreciate our messages, I realize that we're not doing tiny things, we're doing magic. Training the trainer, Lily and I work together quite a lot, um, offering trainings to other organizations in, in, in um, US and in other parts of Africa. Um, our trainings are tailor-made to the particular culture of each community. And we have one country. minute. Okay. One minute. Uh, we've been working in these countries in Africa, India, Nepal, Haiti, Dominica, Mexico, USA. Uh, compassion is not a relationship between the healer and the wounded. It's a relationship between equals. Only when we know our own darkness well, can we be present with the darkness of others. This is something that we hold as a cornerstone within our organization, that we have to really learn to know ourselves and embrace our own pains and losses before we can sit with the pain of others. Um, and I just wanna add in closing that we lead trips to Kenya and Nepal. And if anybody's interested, please, please contact us. Contact us. We'll be going back to Nepal hopefully in September and you would have an opportunity to study with our incredible staff to learn about what we do and to travel to all the programs and have a real intimate experience with um, people you would never get to meet. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Lillian, I love you so much. And um, this was a great experience, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, that was amazing. To, the need, my dear grandmother would say, bless your hearts That's, that's the, for the good work that you do. And I think that what, what is so kind of telling in terms of the effectiveness of, of um, expressive arts therapy are the wonderful smiles of all of the people that, uh, that you have pictured. 
it shows that they have made a journey and you have certainly helped them along that path. So thank you very much. Uh, to our, our viewers, if you have questions for them, uh, please add them to the Q&A section. And then finally, we have our, the discussion of the book, A Time to Talk with Michael Young and Sandy George. So Michael and Sandy. Hi, good afternoon. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, all right, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Oh, let's see. Seem to have gone into annotation mode. One second. Here we go. All right. So, Sandy, would you like to head us off? Sure. I'm Sandy George. I'm the author of A Time to Talk. And I'd like to start with this quote by Dr. Martin Luther King, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Because throughout this presentation, we're going to be urging you to talk about the important things like race, even though it's uncomfortable and the importance of these kinds of conversations. If we stay silent about it, about these events, nothing will happen. So, you know, our essential question for this presentation is why should I talk to my child about race? And of course, it could be uh, your child, it could be your students, you know, really it's context dependent. Um, but we kind of wanted to open this up uh, within sort of the span of the past year, but also the past, uh, you know, number of decades in which this has been occurring. Um, you know, in recent years, especially, we've started to see, um, you know, increasing a number of deaths of uh, Black people at the hands of police brutality. Um, just within 2020 alone, uh, we had Ahmaud Arbery um, killed while jogging. George Floyd was killed by the police during an arrest. And all of a sudden, there were protests all over the world, the largest uh, protests that we'd you know, ever seen, you know, in terms of a global movement. I remember, um, you know, we were just in the midst of the pandemic and everyone was uh, kind of quarantined at home. I was creating a lot of art um, leading up to this point. And I remember at this time, my eyes were just glued to the screen, to a television screen, to a news scroll and constantly uh, just tracking these developments and trying to process these events. Uh, you know, I'm sure I wasn't alone. I know that, you know, this was just something that really took hold of uh, the world and it didn't stop there. We had uh, in August, Jacob Blake stopped, shot in the back seven times. Um, September 23rd, last month, Breonna Taylor's killers were not convicted. Um, and, you know, this is just something that has been an ongoing issue. And there's a lot of talk about uh, police reform and systemic racism and, um, you know, really trying to engage communities in these conversations. So our, our presentation here is going to talk a little bit about uh, child development and sort of the approach that Sandy and I took to uh, trying to address some of these issues. So if you kind of peel back the curtain, this begins when children are first born, right? Uh, infants at three months look more at the faces that match the race of their caregivers. And, you know, we, we understand this, right? Like um, implicit bias exists uh, within people uh, as a result of things that <laughs> at many times uh, we're not fully aware of. And so as kids are developing, two years old, children use race to understand behaviors and choose friends. So young people are exposed to uh, a variety of representations, you know, whether it's uh, with their parents, caregivers, teachers, uh, media that they consume. So that by age five, you know, we, we've are looking at different studies that show that 
people of color show no preference towards racial groups while white children remain biased in favor of whiteness. A lot of these studies are, um, you know, kind of race-based where they you know, kind of sort uh, people by color uh, in sort of race neutral studies that just depict, you know, both uh, black and white children. A lot of times, uh, you know, people don't have that, that same level, but, um, you know, children begin to show prejudice and believe that some groups are better than others. So this is something that exists very early. And studies also show that conversations with this age group can improve attitudes about race in one week. A lot of the feeling and the sentiment is that uh, we shouldn't talk about it with young kids. It's very taboo. Um, you know, part of, you know, sort of people's perceptions is that it's very uncomfortable to have these conversations. Um, but that leads into the, the question, what happens if we don't talk about it? So in this photo, it's, um, it's a photo of an elementary school cafeteria. And one of the things that you'll notice in this photo is in the elementary school cafeteria, everyone's together. Um, there really isn't much segregation, but then something happens when um, students go to high school and suddenly uh, caf the cafeteria is segregated by race and everyone goes to their own racial group. But what happens between elementary school and high school? Why does that change occur? So what usually happens when people talk about race? Um, they'll say things like, well, just don't be racist. And then that's the end of the conversation. Or they'll say something like, there are no racial differences. I don't see color. We're all the same. Well, all of this is problematic. It doesn't work. And these kinds of conversations lead to that high school photo we saw on the previous slide. That's what we do not want to happen. So some of the reasons for um, the segregation that occurs in high school is for many students, School is the only time that they are engaging with people outside of their race. Um, in their household, they're, pro they're only seeing people who look like them. On television, usually they're seeing people that look like them. Um, and stereotypes start to develop. When these stereotypes are not addressed, either through interactions or exposure through media and other sources, when this is not addressed, what happens is we get these awkward interactions that can often be triggering and contain many microaggressions. A lot of this can be avoided if we begin having the conversation earlier. So in elementary school, a lot of the friendships, they're very shallow. It's more, we both like football, so we're gonna be friends. Or my favorite color is red, your favorite color is red too, you're my best friend. When we get to high school, those relationships become deeper. And in order to maintain that relationship on that deeper social level, you have to connect with the other person. You can't see the other person's struggles or connect with them if you're not having conversations about race. You have to have those conversations so you can relate to people who don't look like you. And ways that we can avoid that high school photo is by affirming the identity. So remove I don't see color and think about your identity and affirm that identity. Building bridges through conversations and interactions and then cultivating leadership in those conversations. All of those things will lead to not having that segregated high school photo. So these are just some tips for if you, when you decide to have the talk at home, or I know many of you are teachers, if you decide to have the talk in the, in the classroom, these are just some tips to help. The earlier you start, the better, as you saw on the previous slide, children are thinking about race as early as three months old. So you want to start early. Share your experiences with them and seek out opportunities for diversity. If your child's school isn't diverse, seek out dance classes that might be diverse and other ways to, to promote exposure. 
when talking about racism, don't just talk about historical examples of racism, also talk about current examples. One of the things that we touch on in the book is that so many people believe that racism ended when the civil rights movement um, began, and that's not the case, right? Racism still exists. So talk about the present examples of racism. Be open and honest, and I think this is very painful and uncomfortable for many people, but share your biases. Talk about times when maybe you had a stereotype or you had a bias and how you overcame that. You are your child's best model. So, and again, this is something that we talked about previously. You really, really want to avoid, I don't see color. I feel like when I was growing up, and probably many of you in, in, in the 90s, um, it was very much, we're all the same, we don't see color. But I'm from Grenada, I'm West Indian, and that West Indian heritage is so much of who I am and how I've developed as a person. When you say to me that you don't see color, I feel like you're not seeing me and all of the parts that make me who I am. So just avoid that sentence, I don't see color. It is okay to see color. It is okay to see differences. It's not okay to act on those differences. And of course, staying silent. Um, your, your kids are talking about this. They're talking about this in school. They're having these conversations in the cafeteria. They need you to be their guide. You don't want another five-year-old confirming your five-year-old's beliefs about race. You want to be able to step in and have those conversations with your child. So, you know, where does that lead us? So, you know, I kind of alluded to, um, you know, last May and, um, you know, what was going on in the world and, you know, feeling this sense of wanting to do something, um, trying to figure out how to lend my own voice. Um, and, you know, and, and my own abilities or, or skills to this um, situation. And I, I found the really, you know, you know, wonderful opportunity when Sandy uh, called me and asked me to illustrate this book. And it's a time to talk raising anti-racist kids. So um, we released this book in back in July through Amazon Kindle Direct Publishing. And so Sandy's the author, I'm the illustrator. And the book's designed to foster family communication skills around all of these topics, racism, ethnic diversity, and police relations, all inspired by current events. So the plot of the book, uh, it follows a young boy named Liam who hears Black Lives Matter protesters outside his window, which opens up an uncomfortable but important family discussion. And through the conversation, Liam learns how to be an ally and not a bystander. And it's kind of a window into families being able to start conversations about uh, racism and becoming an ally. Sandy, would you like to make a comment about our inspiration or you rather your inspiration for the book? Oh, of course. Um, so as mentioned before, I'm a fourth grade teacher. Um, and this conversation started in, I mean, this conversation, the writing of this book started around May. And this is kind of at the height of the protests. Um, one of my students reached out to me, this is while we were virtually teaching. And one of my students' parents reached out to me and she told me a conversation she had with her child and had questions about how to talk to him. So this student in, in my class last year, his best friend is black and this student is white. And after watching everything that was going on in the news, he said to his mom, well, is this something that could happen to my best friend? And that was very upsetting for her and it was very upsetting for me to hear. Um, and she kind of was stumped and didn't know how to have the conversation with him. And that led to this started as a social story for my class. And it just kind of, it turned into this, into this beautiful book that I'm really hoping people can use to um, start these conversations the way that she was able to have this conversation with her child in her household. And part of that conversation comes with the action list. Um, you know, really this comes down to what can young people uh, do about it? So um, 
you know, as, as Liam's parents are engaging with him in this conversation and exploring, you know, some of his deeper concerns, explaining uh, some of the issues of systemic racism that uh, create the conditions for him to be uh, worried and, you know, trying to process what's happening, um, you know, right outside his window. Um, one, one minute, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, they come up with an action plan together. Uh, which is listening and believing to people's experiences, speaking up if you're seeing something wrong, if you see something wrong, showing your support through poster stories and art, and when you get old enough, vote to make sure we don't have to protest about this again. So this book exists within a context of um, you know, many other social justice books which exist, and you know we hope that it's something that you can seek out. It's available on Amazon, both in paperback and ebook format. And uh, we hope that you're able to have this conversation with a young person in your life or a number of young people as a result. Well, thank you so much. I think what I love about this presentation is that it's the combination of a wonderful text with some very practical things that I can do. And, and at the same time, uh, it's combining art and uh, a lot can get communicated through the, through the cartoons, can't it? So that's, that's very good. We have about 10 minutes left and we have some questions uh, for presenters. Let me... Um, let me just go ahead and, and this one is for Kristen from Johan. Uh, great presentation and great initiative. It is great to see how the initiatives you shared are creating environmental awareness with children and youth in a fun way. Do you find that there are activities create a good understanding with the kids about climate change and will shape their actions and behaviors in the long term? Also, how do you make those resources and programs broadly available? Yeah, those are the big questions, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. Uh, well, first of all, um, I'm afraid that in the climate crisis, the children are going to have to leave the adults. So we're actually kind of growing it up. As children learn about this in the early elementary grades and beyond, they go home to their parents and they want to do something. And so the parents say, oh, all right. So in many cases, it's not just a question of, you know, mirroring what's happening at home. It's actually starting something in the school and bringing it to the home. Mm -hmm. So I think part of the way to make it last is for the school leadership to make a commitment to having something change in the school. And I will tell you, having um, taught many teachers in many different districts, recycling is not the thing to make you start to get your school conscious because recycling plans fall apart. You have to deal with the custodial staff, the municipal uh, pickup, whether they even have recycling in the city, whether the school district will pay for it. It's very complex, honestly. And so if people, if the recycling doesn't work, they say, well, then nothing will work. Realize that recycling is one of the harder things to accomplish, not the easier things. Actually, composting is much easier to accomplish in a school because you can train everybody where they can bring their food scraps and it can be the compost for a garden behind the school, something like that. So you're lowering the waste and you know making kids a lot more conscious about what they eat and everything else. Um, there are all kinds of things that students can do, but all I can say is in, in a you know 20 second answer, start with the students and work your way up. And when the parents get more involved, the caregivers, then it can turn into a neighborhood initiative and it might turn into a city initiative and beyond. But it, it starts with the kids because their passion is very contagious. Good, thank you very much. Next, we have a question uh, for Gloria. What types of intervention are the educators prepared to perform if participants approach subjects that are deeply traumatic to them while working on a project? That's, that's for Gloria, for Lillian. Okay, can you hear me? Y yes, yes, we can hear Lillian, you. Lillian, could you please hop on here as well, please? Lily. Um, Rob, do you mind repeating the question? Yes. It's 
What types of intervention are the educators prepared to perform if participants approach subjects that are deeply traumatic to them while working on a project? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll just say one thing. We don't call ourselves educators. We're facilitators. And we are, um, we listen really carefully to the participants. Uh, we don't always have the perfect answer. Um, I'll just, Lillian, could you please come back on here? Um, be a part of this. Um, I think for myself, I'm not afraid of anything that's going to come up. I feel a lot of confidence that I can hold a safe environment for a child or woman, no matter what's coming up in the situation. And I'm also not afraid to say, I don't know what to say or do right now. I don't have an answer. But I think mostly we connect heart to heart. We connect um, and we're available to, to listen, to talk, to brainstorm. And um, part of the child-centered approach is that we believe that the children and adults have their own answers within. So we, we try to empower um, and focus on the strengths of the child. And Lillian, could you please add to this? I don't know what, what else to say right now. Um, I, th I think uh, we work with the, the clients that we work with, either the women, the children, they lead and we follow. So if, um, if uh, we give them also opportunity to choose what kind of model they would want us to use. And uh, the fact that we believe that uh, they have, they know what they want. They only need you to be there as a witness mm -hmm. and be there to journey with them and give them the hope to go on. I think um, that is what really enables us to work with the group that we work with. Mm, thanks, Lily. I'll just add one thing. Um, I worked with children with cancer for eight years and many of them died. And those were the ones who taught me how to sit with pain. I didn't run away, I didn't leave. I stayed and I was committed to learn about what they really needed and wanted. Um, and so again, personally, I can sit with any situation and um, make somebody feel comfortable that I won't leave them and I'm, we're there together. So I don't know if that answers the question, but. Mm -hmm. Good, good, thank you. Sandy, there was a question for you, but it has disappeared. Um, hopefully that person can contact you with the question. And let me near, unless you can find the question for Sandy that disappeared. Yeah, I think, I think Sandy actually answered it, but Sandy, if you wanna answer that, um, live as well thank you um is it the question that i just about using this in adult environment um uh, you can do both um the, that one and the one about the 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 point of view from liam's liam's oh death. thank you um yes i would love to explore liam's best friend's point of view i think part of the reason i didn't go that route is I want to say this in the right way. I feel like so many of these books exist for people of color, how to deal with um, interactions with the police and how to deal with racism that I, th I, th I thought it would be important to maybe show the other side of that viewpoint. Um, but I definitely would love to explore Liam's best friend and how this has impacted him. Um, and then the other question for adults in the workplace, Yes, <laughs> I do think this book can be applied in the workplace, especially the first item on the list, which is just listen and, and believe people's experiences. I think as adults, so many of us have prior knowledge that it's really difficult to listen to another person's experience that doesn't align with ours and then to believe that experience. So just doing that in the workplace, practicing sharing more of those experiences and just listening and believing those experiences and going from there, I think is a really important first step. Great, well, thank you very much, Sandy. And thanks to all of you, all the presenters. I love this session. 
and uh, you you provided great information, uh, a lot of insight, uh, stories were told, and thank you so much for doing that. Uh, also, thank for our thanks to our viewers. And also, I'd like to have a shout out to some people behind the scenes that you don't see, but Munir, who you just heard speak, and Shaz, who's also watching this, who has helped, has brought all of this, that she and, and Munir have brought all of this together. So I would just like to um, encourage you tomorrow, starting at 9.30, session number three, the Arts as a Way Forward, uh, session number three panel. So thank you once again and good evening.